Okay, I want to welcome everyone. Um, I'm sure there'll be a few more people joining us, but um, we'll get started. Um, with us today is Professor Mary White. Um, we're going to discuss living with uncertainty. Um, it is a subject that concerns all of us. Each of us bring to the subject their own unique perspective, um, but everyone in the world is feeling the same way. So great that we're going to start having this conversation and um, hopefully we can continue together to talk about it because I think for the rest of our lives, it is going to be um, really important. Um, a little bit about the China U.S. Women's Foundation. We have uh, two of the founders, Mingyi Yu and Lisa Phillips and myself. We started the foundation in 2017 to be a bridge between uh, China and the U.S. women to help women to thrive by encouraging events. Um, I don't know that I knew about Zoom back in 2017, but conversations that would be helpful for stimulating conversations. Uh, we remain committed to that, um, regardless of politics or the environment, talking with each other about topics of concern is only good and we uh, will continue to do that. Um, Thank you, Mary, for joining us. I just wanted to say a few things about um, the topic that we chose, um, living with uncertainty. Um, the German sociologist Ulrich Beck uh, was the first person to coin the term risk society. Um, it's the manner in which society focus on the uncontrollability, ignorance, and uncertainty in the modern world. Um, Globalization creates uh, risks that concern people of different classes. Affluent people try to shield themselves from it. People, poor people um, suffer it, but some issues you can't avoid risks like climate change. Um, so we're in a new um, environment. Um, the rules have changed and um, the more we talk about it, the better. Um, there are different approaches to risks. Um, the Buddhist Pima Chodron says, you know, embrace risk, uh, get to know the risk, and through experiencing the risks, you will gain greater consciousness. Um, sociologists, psychologists say, think about risk in terms of what can you control, try to mitigate the risk that's personal <clears throat> and let the rest kind of take care of itself. Um, so the jury's out about risk uh, management. Um, so Mary, I'd like to just introduce you a little bit, give a little bit about your bio, and then uh, I welcome your remarks about uh, living in uncertain times. Mary White retired this summer from 25 years of teaching medical ethics and humanities at Wright State University in Ohio. She relocated to Vermont in August and is in the process of creating a new home and a new life closer to old friends and familiar landscapes. She is learning from her own reactions to this transition, occurring as it is in a time of exceptional uncertainty over our national and global future. So welcome, Mary. I look forward to hearing uh, your thoughts. Well, it's thank you. Thanks, Leslie. And, and thanks for gathering together all these lovely people. It's nice that it's a small group. And so I would just like to say, this should be a conversation. We're all dealing with different kinds of uncertainty, different histories in our personal lives, different, different concerns, personal political points in between. Um, and they all matter. They all matter a lot. Uh, so when I started thinking about this, I made a list of sources of uncertainty. And first, um, I wonder if I should say anything more about myself. Uh, I taught medical students primarily all those years, residents, public health students. I was at a medical school. Um, those were wonderful years. They got me a bit around the world. I did a bit of work in Africa that was really eye-opening. Um, bioethics is a new field that waxes and wanes. We are finding with the fortunes of healthcare and um, we could talk a lot about the uncertainties in healthcare at this time. 
um, which are about as uncertain as they get. Um, but I love Vermont, have long, strong ties here, and given a chance to get out of, of Swing County in a swing state, that would be Ohio, I seized it. And it is very scary to let go of one's uh, career comforts, that sense of identity and belonging to something bigger than you and part of a, a largely um, well thought of profession that would be higher education and or medicine. Um, and feeling like you're doing worthwhile good work there. It's, it's hard to let that go. But there are reasons for letting it go that I don't regret. And it's just a question now of how to refashion a life given the urgencies we face today. So those urgencies, most painfully to anyone paying attention in the last few days and week, involve our elections, our Supreme Court, the likely uh, unwilling transfer of power, if that is what we're facing, the even more frightening um, re-election of the current commander in chief. Meanwhile, much of the West Coast is going up in flames. Well, one of the most important people known as the leader of the free world is denying the reality of climate change, is denying the expertise fundamental to scientific and medical research, is calling into question um, both what causes this pandemic and how best to immunize against it. I mean, when we rely for our safety on issues of fact, to have someone neglect those matters, uh, leading this country into harm's way willingly, eagerly is beyond words. We have, of course, uh, a bizarre combination of a, of a roaring stock market in the midst of a recession no one can make sense of. And I expect many of us are kind of wondering how that's going to play out. Um, climate change, which I would love to disbelieve, but I can't bring myself to do that. Uh, the last 24 hours in Louisville. What can be said? But the loss of confidence in, in our judicial system, in the American dream, in ever obtaining fairness, basic equal rights for African Americans in this country. The violence, the nonviolent protests, the widespread concern over what we're dealing with. I mean, the, the, this is, this is, I think, the strongest catalyst for change we have right now, the most important movement we've got going right now. I think powers, if they could, would return us to a world we used to know, but this movement, Black Lives Matter and its affiliates, this will not stop, I do not think, until important changes are made in law enforcement, police training, police recruitment, all the way down all the way up. Um, so we've got that in the world we live in. Most of us seem to be on the other side of 45. Um, so we're looking at what does aging mean for us? What does retirement mean for some of us? What illnesses are we dealing with in the present or likely to in the future? What about our families? What about our children? Do we wanna stay where we are? Do we wanna relocate like <clears throat> yours truly? Um, those are, the, those are the questions and concerns of we the fortunate. The pandemic has brought some concerns. I'm sure some of our classmate, classmates, in addition to me, are looking at job changes. Kit is one of us. Kit, you can speak to this at some point. Um, loss of job security, loss of perhaps health insurance, perhaps loss of home for some. Um, other changes, foreseen and unforeseen. We're facing all of it. I mean, how much uncertainty do we need to call this living in an unusual time of uncertainty? But here we are. So 
given that little litany that we got, I started thinking about all these different ways that we respond to it. Um, some of the uh, have to do with my own personal responses, which are mixed. And some have to do with the responses we can see around us. I just want to start with recognizing that most of our responses have an emotional source. And as an emotional source, our emotional experience varies uniquely with each of us. And how we perceive the risks, the threats, the uncertainties that we're dealing with will be very unique to each of us. I'm sure we're all familiar with, with friends, acquaintances who have differing attitudes toward the necessity of mask wearing or how frightened they are of this particular plague. Um, and that, that sometimes correlates oddly with who we would think would be anxious and who is and isn't. Um, but, but there are reasons for that in terms of how we understand and interpret risks. We don't need to go into all of that today, but just take that as a given that people understand risk and uncertainty differently, each of us. But some of the pieces that contribute to that understanding, and that's what I, I think might be worth exploring today. Um, there's a piece I recognize in myself and we see in others that involves denial, distraction, and comfort strategies. I have only very briefly taken part in the global bake fest that is going on right now, but for a while there, you could not buy a sack of flour. You know, it's not just in this country. It's not just in Europe. It's everywhere. People are taken to their kitchens. What's that about? We know what that's about, but so there's a bake fest. That's a simple thing. I have not yet, I'm sort of proud to say, seen one online movie. I much prefer to go to books, but you're talking to a nerdy academic. Um, so, but many people are filling their time with online entertainment. It's there. I find it profoundly unsatisfying, particularly music. All these, you know, performances that are being blasted at us from all the, the, the anyone in music of whatever sort. It just doesn't work without the live, live experience, the energy moving around the room. And I hope that we'll find ways to talk about that more. But that's certainly something. And of course, any community, any organization, any individual that is used to or relies on public support is as Leslie is doing today, reaching out to us online. And this is a very smart way of reaching out in that it's pulling people who don't normally get to see each other, pulling us together. Um, but we get bombarded with Zoom invitations or, or lecture invitations. I spent a little bit of time in the last couple of days listening to um, talks on the Atlantic Festival. Anybody else go there? Some good stuff, including Tony Fauci. Um, got a bit more candid sense of what's going on in his thinking. So denial and distraction, that's one we all can recognize. Anger, we can all recognize. The media is going hysterical. You know, the finger pointing at our president goes on and on and on. The anger, the taking to the streets, the activism. Then we have some violence, some looting, some deaths. Anger, big one. Anger, let me just say, is easy. Hate, I hate to say it, is easy. We are encouraged to go down this path by the media. Sorry, Carl, I expect you know what I'm saying though, that we, we are, the media can only give us sort of one coherent thought at a time. Complexity is elusive in a short article. Um, these are complex moments. Our emotions need to be recognized as complicated, as multifaceted. Anger and hate are easy to arouse, easy to keep going. This QAnon stuff relies on demonizing somebody else. A lot of what we're hearing this week about what Trump and, and the entire Republican Party is eager to do with the next Supreme Court justice appointment is trying to incite anger, generosity of pocketbook, and, and motivate a pushback. This is complicated. This is not an easy, constitutionally clear situation, what the right response should be. Um, but anger and hate make it feel like it is. I caution all of us to try not to go there easily. It's so easy 
to demonize the others. One, perhaps because I taught ethics in a public school where I was required always to recognize that there are multiple perspectives and be very careful about owning and knowing my own biases. Um, I think it's important that we come at all of these issues now knowing and owning that we have biases that are easy to support if we just look at the articles that agree with us. I, I believe it is important to look at the media that does not agree with us, to look at it critically so we can see where its data may not be as sound as we think it should be, but where its arguments are legitimate, to know that, recognize them, and see what we think of them. You know, if we disagree and, and can, can understand that disagreement and work with it, we are much stronger than just rejecting it. Anger, dangerous. I, I fear part of the problem that the worst thing that Trump has done is to divide this country through, through anger, through us and them. He's only leader of a red country. All us blue people don't deserve any federal funding for anything. And, and that, is, that is both a, a rejection of his responsibilities as, as a president, but it's been extremely dangerous and it's gonna take decades to heal. Faith, a second or a third response, denial, anger. Here's another one, faith. Out there in Ohio, the social studies are wonderful. I miss them already here in Vermont. You know, most people are kind of rational, even if some vote for Trump. But I was, I was, you know, the creation museums out that way. I had a fundamentalist Baptist university about five miles from my house. I, the guy who came to fix my washing machine was convinced that we're living in the end times. It's good stuff. Um, <laughs> but faith can give you explanations. It can give you reasons for hope. It can give you comfort. Faith has its purposes. Faith has its uses, even if you are a secular person. Figure out where your faith is, because remember, there are no atheists in foxholes. We believe in something, if only in human goodness. We believe in something, and that's helping us get through these times. Figure out what your faith is. What do you worship? I hope it's not your bank account. Figure out what you worship. Make it worth worshiping. But faith can give us hope. I am a divinity school graduate and a secular person. I was never much of a faithful person, but I found that education fascinating because we all want some sort of moral and existential orientation. I believe the Protestant fundamentalist churches, more so than the Jewish community, have let us down by not trying to ramp up what they have to say to be at all coherent with the times we live in. Um, I, I'm not experienced enough in, in the, the wealth of perspectives that you find in Judaism, but among my Jewish friends, I, I find a much more reasoned approach to that integration. Um, and I won't go into other faiths right now. Um, Perhaps one of the most common feelings we all share, at least at times, at these times, is this sense of sort of suspended animation. We're waiting. We're waiting for COVID to end and life to return to normalcy. We're waiting for the election to be over. Please let it be over, just so we can deal with what it is. But this waiting is awful. Um, we're waiting for, for routines to return. But do, do, am I alone in this? Many of my friends talk about this. We don't know what day of the week it is. We don't have to dress for work. You know, we, we do our work thing back when I was teaching online. You know, who cared? I would show up with a shirt on. Now I always showed up with the rest on too, but you know, <laughs> you get the idea. Uh, it's just a very strange time with so much upended so quickly. This suspension leads to a kind of listlessness, an inability I mean, if I were not in this crazy state, I would have written four or five articles by now. But instead, I wonder about, you know, where I'll put my furniture and so forth in my new home and what I will do next. It's, it's just a ridiculous sort of time of inability to make decisions. Um, so I hope that we'll talk about that with you guys. Something I don't think we talk enough about are grief and fear. Fear, which this week certainly 
Ginsburg's death and uh, and something like that Atlantic article going into gory description of just how many ways the Republicans can jigger the election returns and postpone um, any any transfer of power. Uh, fear is easy to fall into. I'm not so sure fear is a useful emotion at this time, unless it, it, it spurs a little bit of action or a lot of action. But fear is huge if unacknowledged. If, if you think there's fear going on, take a look at where it comes from. Most of our fear is unnamed. The best way to control it, you gotta start by naming it. Fear of what? Is this rational? And some of it we can't answer, is this rational? Is this real? I'm finding it really hard, and I don't know if it's because I'm ignorant or optimistic or just too scared to look at it, to find it really hard to imagine the mayhem that could occur on November 4th or January. I, I just, it's out of the realm of my experience. I don't, I don't know how to put imagery to it. The lawyers among you do. Randy, I'm sure last week is, but we are not Yugoslavia. We are not Chile or Venezuela or Brazil. You know, we are not Turkey yet, or the Philippines or North Korea yet. Could we go there? Do we have enough constraints on that? I want to believe so, but maybe we don't. This president has been so good at toppling stuff. I just don't know how fearful I should be. I don't know what's a rational level of fear, but fear should be there. And relating to fear has got to be grief. Grief, we also choose not to acknowledge unless it's hitting us upside the head. We can't avoid it. The grief kid, I have musicians here, the grief of musicians who cannot perform is beyond words. There are no words because most of us don't understand what that is about. That is about expression, not just of someone else's music, but of yourself and connecting with others in a meaningful, deeply meaningful, profound way. And I can't do it, kid. You can do more on that later, but, but when you cannot be yourself because of this pandemic, it's more than not even being able to wear, a, of having to wear a face mask and not being visible to the world, looking like a bandit in some funny way all the time. That's a loss of communality, but the loss of identity and connection um, that can come through so many other aspects of this pandemic. The grief of seeing a loved one in a long-term care facility that you cannot touch and watching that person die as a result. The grief, the grief for the loss of the American dream, even if it was only ever a dream. The grief for the loss of human decency. We now know there are people who have no decency, lots of them, too many sitting in the Senate. I grieve that. I recognize I must have been a dreamer. Power is intoxicating, but the willingness of so many people to capitulate at this time in ways that hurt so many, be they children on our border, be there people who could lose health insurance, who have already lost health insurance, jobs, security, homes, the, the indifference to this. And you start thinking about all this and you get angry and you get fearful and you empathize. And then your empathy for those children on the border and those African-Americans in the streets and the countless other immigrants who have been deported or can't get here, the people in refugee camps around the world, the countless many in misery beyond our understanding and your empathy is too burdensome, and you go back to watching your movie. What do we do with empathy, which is the most humanizing of all human emotions? It connects us, not just to people, but to animals, to trees, to our environment, to the landscape 
that is burning up on the West Coast to the birds that are trying to migrate and falling out of the sky dead because they cannot breathe. What do we do with empathy when we can't bear it anymore? Is that to say it's beyond me? Is that fragility a word we're getting familiar with now? Should we get past that? and say, never mind my empathy, I'm going to call Democrats tonight. I'm assuming we're mostly, we're all Democrats here, but who knows? I'm going to call my tribe tonight. Um, so those are, those are some of the ways I think about responses. Um, and then I, I, I think it wouldn't be fair to dump all that out there without saying what I think we should do with that. And I know this sounds very, Pat and Hackneyed, and I am absolutely no um, representative of the mindfulness community. I've never felt I could do it whatsoever. But I do think that a place to start with all of this is paying attention to our emotions and naming what they are. Naming them is the first way to controlling them. It's like ethics, I used to teach my students, if you're caught in an ethical conflict, if you're just mad and frustrated, that won't get you anywhere. Figure out where the conflicts come from. Name them. Then you might figure out what to do. But until you can name them, you can't move. Name your emotions here. What is causing your grief, your anger, your hate, your fear, your, your empathy? And then prioritize. What can you deal with close to home, in your household, in your neighborhood, in your state, in your country? in the world. Prioritize what your skills are, what you love, what you care about, what you can do. And I actually think you cannot spend more energy beyond your education in grieving the stuff you cannot change. You, we can't afford to become paralyzed right now. We must take care of the energies we have to make the differences we can. And and that is where I am with this. Just trying to name how many different kinds of causes trigger me, how many different kinds of responses I have. I think one I did not mention, which might be considered protective, is accepting or claiming that I don't know everything, that it's quite possible um, I'm wrong from time to time. And oddly, that gives me a little comfort. I don't want to say, oh, I can't possibly understand this stuff. I have no opinion and I get to do nothing. That's not good enough. But I, don't, I, I want to allow for the fact that I don't know everything. And maybe there's more to some of these questions than I am capable of grasping now. So accepting a little bit of humility in the midst can't hurt either. Um, and that's all I got to say. I really want this to be a chat, a conversation. So I'd love to hear from you, you know, what you're grappling with, how you find yourself responding to it, what you find fruitful, um, how our crazy times are having, uh, shifting uh, relations interpersonally and our relationships with our work and where we find most meaning in what we do. Can I turn it over to you now? Yes, so um, Mary, thank you so much. That was really quite profound and very um, comforting that we're starting to have a conversation about these very big issues. Um, and I would like to welcome everyone to start, you know, having a conversation. I'd just like to add another aspect, which you as a professor know, and um, the Women's Foundation is actually planning a Gen Z global forum on October 15th mainly with Wellesley students who were interns with us this summer. So I feel like we're kind of the elder states people in this discussion. We're kind of mourning what was, and yet the next generation, the Gen Zers and even the millennials, are having to somehow incorporate all these new factors into their future. So they're making the jump into, you know, the Zoom world and virtual world probably much more easily than we are. And yet a lot of the comforts that we had, which was being together physically, they're having to forsake. So I think that is also 
causing a lot of disturbance. And as elder statesmen, um, I hope we can kind of lead them um, as we gain consciousness about the new reality, maybe we can share our knowledge for the next generation because we have a lot of mess to clean up <laughs> before we leave the stage. So that, those are my comments. And now I welcome everyone else to um, share their thoughts. Don't forget to unmute. Uh, hi. Um, I, I, first of all, my husband Andy is joining us because I thought this would be something that he would benefit from as well. He got here a little late, but um, he's a stage, a Broadway stagehand, or was. <laughs> and um, and yeah, Mary, it's. I think for me, the hardest thing, the first few months were kind of fun in a weird way because I got to have dinner with my husband like more than I had for our entire marriage um, that we actually, we, we weren't baking, <laughs> but we did really enjoy creating. It was, it was actually art, it, creating good food and, and exploring that, which um, has, has really in many ways been a good salve for us. But um, for me, it, more and more, it's clear that my identity and unfortunately, I was 100% invested in my identity as a singer. I didn't have things on the side beyond sort of political pockets of activism, but really not particularly in, you know, hard work, not as much hard work as I wish I'd done. But um, it's been extremely hard. And I think, yeah, the fear at 64 and a half of, uh, knowing that I'm not going to be singing for a long time. I, for a while, I was recording at home. So I had some interest in, in learning technology that I'm not particularly good at to do that. Um, but my church job is now gone and choral sing, pro choral singing was what I had devolved into. I'm not a soloist really anymore. And now I don't, I see myself as retired um, I haven't made that statement to my contractors who hire me because I'm not ready to fully commit to dropping out. Part of me feels the noble thing is I'm going to let the next generation have their opportunities where I've been taking up slots. And I think that's a good thing, a noble thing, but it's, it rips my heart out at the same time. And my social collegial affiliations are hard to maintain. Um, and I'm not a Zoom person, but I have discovered WhatsApp is really good and uh, FaceTime. I am trying. I, I'm sick of the phone. I don't like phone. I'm sick of texting, which I'm really happy to have gotten to that point. But I find that being able to see the person I'm talking to is a really good substitute um, so Zoom is good, but it's hard to truly have conversations. So I should actually shut up. But um, I will add one line that my husband has said, which is he really didn't expect at 57 to be taking his gap year. Right? And I wasn't expecting to have retirement forced on me. But in some ways, I will confess, because I'm not the singer I used to be, and I was very good. <laughs> I'll try to not do expletives. I was really good at what I did. Um, I have had, I have a hard time thinking that I have to find a new identity. And also I want to work. I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't know what to do with myself at this point. So that's hard. May I just say to that point, I don't either. It's totally <laughs> weird. Not having a job. It is really weird. Wow. And you opted for it. Well, I got a, I got a, re a retirement incentive. Higher oh. education is in financial distress everywhere right now. Yeah. And that I was thinking I'd retire in a year anyway, but I sent out my CV last night. It's just like, this is too weird. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your thoughts.
Oh, and I also, I want, I want to add, um, you know, this won't last forever. You know, there probably will be a vaccine. So, Kit, you can probably go back to singing. I just want us all to, like, you know, the power of hope, you know, really don't, like, pack it up, girls, you know, before, you know, the time has come, you know, Part of rage against the, dawn, <laughs> the falling of the light, you know, so uh, let's can, not can, call it a day I, yet. I will say, though, that, that this is a, it, it would be, it's like telling an athlete that taking a year off that they can come back, and this is a use it or lose it period of time at my age, so. Yeah. I, I know. That's but, the harder part of it. Yeah. And yes, but I will also add that gardening has become <laughs> also another creative joy for the most part. So that's my other thing that I can take time to do and see the results. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I just have to caution folks on being too optimistic about a vaccine <laughs> because from kids standpoint, a vaccine might work for some people, some of the time, a little bit, but, and it might permit singers to regroup and sing, but she still needs an audience. Mm. And who's gonna feel comfortable showing up in a congregation or a concert hall? Yeah. It's serious. In, in singing in particular, the aerosol factor is terrifying. It, That's right. It you know church, some of the older churches are actually in better condition because they're so drafty. But the bottom line is, um, there the the virus has mutated to be more uh, more contagious, uh, and um, it's just to my mind, I I can't risk it. Um, my husband is as I said, he's a stagehand on Broadway you're right, who's who's going to be in the audience? Who's going to be performing on Broadway stages? It, it's terrifying. So, yeah, it's not a great time. <laughs> no. I'm curious to hear from others, though. Who spoke? So Carl, yeah. um, if you've joined us from Nigeria, um, what's it like uh, in Nigeria? How are they dealing with the with COVID and uh, change circumstances? Well, first of all, Mary, I enjoy hearing from you, and uh, it's uh, a lot of emotions come to mind right now. I think one reason why it's a pleasure doing this because most of us know each other. We have a baseline where we have a memory of how we were, but we know we can't go back to how we were. We know we've all grown and learned, learned, <coughs> learned so much since then. So if you want to go into my period of uncertainty and getting, I will get to your question, Leslie. You know, I live in London. I'm a journalist and uh, I've been freelance for a while. And when the lockdown happened in the UK and other countries, I couldn't travel. So all of a sudden, for four months, I really wasn't working. And uh, I won't say it freaked me out, but London is high rent and it was unpleasant. And I was, <laughs> excuse me, I was doing some remote work and uh, there's a possibility that I may be returning to Washington. Just by the way, I've been overseas since 96. And uh, I'm very attuned to what's happening because of my work. In fact, what I'm doing here right now, I'm working for an African satellite channel where the audience is Sub-Saharan Africa. And I'm training staff here locally, and I'm also commenting and explaining U.S. politics and the social unrest to an African audience. In fact, I've got to do something about an hour from now, so I actually have to leave in a few minutes. And so I have to keep, kind of keep it very simple. But in terms of how it's affecting me and my uncertainty, I actually feel at this particular moment in time a little bit better and safer here than in London because all of a sudden the U.K. has gone back into a number of restrictions short of a lockdown effective tonight. And being by myself in London, UK, I hated it because I was working remotely, I'm by myself, I don't have a family or a partner. And there would be days when I wasn't even talking to anyone, except when I went to the, the grocery store to buy food. I wasn't talking to anyone. But you know, I'm a strong, resilient guy. I've had near life and death experiences because of my work 
as a journalist from Iran, Afghanistan, Gaza, you name it, Malawi, the Congo. So I'm pretty resilient, I'm pretty strong. So when you talk about faith, Mary, it's also a faith in yourself. Because, you know, a lot of people, you've got to have a strong bedrock of faith in yourself. But my point is this. I don't feel safe going back to UK. I don't know if I can take another six months of that. So I'm here now where things work. And in fact, there's been interesting editorials, you know, running about why is Africa not as bad off as the US? And in part because they've already gone through situations like Ebola or whatever. And so they've already have a, 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 a compliance system in place. I arrived at the airport, everyone was wearing masks. Everyone was keeping social distancing. I was really, really surprised and amazed. And everyone was polite. No one was complaining. And I think when you talked about humility, Mary, you can't complain because everyone's going through something in a different degree. So it's a lot of humility right there. But in terms of my personal choices, I don't know if I feel safe going back to London, UK. I, I want to go back to Washington. I've been interviewing for jobs with news organizations. Touch wood, I may have a, a job to go back to because I really want to participate. I feel strongly what's happening, what's happening politically. And as, a, you know, as an African-American, I especially feel very strongly about what's happening. So there's that. Uh, when I talk about you know, not, uh, being alone and not having a family or partner, I have a daughter uh, who's in Rome. Her mother's Italian, so she's Italian, African-American. She's never been to the States. And yet the good news is I'm just so grateful for the fact that we have a good relationship. I was in Rome and in July and Italy is so far ahead in terms of coping with it. And, uh, you know, I'm just hardened the very fact that I can talk every day. She started school last week for the first time. So there's a peace of mind thing, you know, having friends and family to share things with. I said, well, okay, if Amanda's okay, that's a good thing. If I can get to the States and bring her there, introduce her after all this stuff is over, that's a good thing. If I have a job to do here, that's a good thing. Is going back to the UK the right thing? I don't think so, maybe not. So there's a big looming question mark. And the good news is I have my health. I've survived near five and death things more times than I want to admit. So I'm very humbled right now. And one reason why I'm, I'm just joining this now is because I just wanted to listen. I just wanted to hear. I don't feel like I'm, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm an empty blade, slate when I talk to you because you already have an idea of who I am. But of course, obviously I've changed and I'm just getting ideas as I listen to you. I like what Mary is saying. And fortunately and unfortunately, I think this is an ongoing conversation we're gonna have to revisit. But I think it also what it boils down to is, when you talk about having control, how do you make personal choices? And one thing you said, Mary, is important is also labeling things, giving names to things. The last thing I'll say is this before going, when I speak about, when I think about grief, I, I think about what I've missed, what I've lost by making the choices I've made, traveling overseas, wanting to be overseas because, you know, I never traveled before. Neither of my parents really ever traveled at all. And I think about my mother and my father who are not here, and uh, I miss them very, very, very much. And I say, well, gee, if I'd done this, I'd done that, maybe it could have been different or better. I can't beat myself up about it. But the way parents are, parents never tell you what they've gone through to get you where you are. You know, they, they, they managed to get me to get Sid well and through X, Y, Z ways and I had a scholarship there because they didn't have certain things. And then I went to Harvard for undergrad and years later the Kennedy School. But they had, they had never traveled. They didn't get a passport till like they were almost 70. And me, I burned through seven of them. And they're not around for me to share that with. So you talk about kid also not, you know, not wanting to take up space for others. I think we have to be also about renewing and reinventing ourselves. I'm ready to do that. I'm happy to do that. I don't want to leave my profession. I'm glad when I was speaking to someone at one of the networks and saying, Carl, you have a place to feel to mentor people, blah, 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 and get involved with news coverage. I said, well, I want to do that. I embrace that. I want to come home because the good news is touch wood is as long as you have your health, that's the most important thing. Your health is your wealth. I'm happy about that. So in short, I'm dealing with a lot of uncertainty because I don't know if I can manage going back to the UK. I'm going back maybe in a month's time, just before the election, just to come up there and check my place. But I'm looking really hard about leaving, maybe coming back to the US, you know, seeing my daughter. They want me to stay here. You know, they're taking care of me. I don't have to worry about anything. But that's not my life either. I care so much about what's happening home. I, want, I don't want to say I'm homesick, but I'll say that I miss the things that made me who I am. And part of it just goes to what we're doing right now. I don't have to explain myself to you. You, you already have an idea of who I am, and now you're just seeing you know, a 2020 version of me. It's so good to hear from you, Carl. And 
if you ever want to continue the conversation in another format, that would be wonderful. I, I just wish you all success in navigating this next bit. We should continue that. So we'll, we'll, the good news is we, we've all touched base. We all have connected. So this is a very good thing. And I'm being very selfish, as I'm sure a lot of people are, because I knew I wanted to do this. And in terms of humility, I think I needed to do this. So Carl, I'm glad you're becoming a celebrity in Nigeria. That's a positive uh, step. I'm glad they appreciate your fine qualities. And of course, Nigeria is a growing power. So that is not to be underestimated, the fact that you are teaching people there and providing guidance. So kudos to you and good luck with that. Thank you, and you're right. I'm almost, I'm, I'm almost embarrassed by the fact they're hanging on every word that I say. Uh, <laughs> they, really, they really, really are as I explain things because I'm just very patient with everyone. And but also, I'm also very respected because, again, the last bit I'll say is that a lot of the most talented people, artist-wise and otherwise, in terms of authors, playwrights, and stuff, you can look at recent articles in the New York Times, Washington Post, are Nigerians. You know, British Nigerians, Nigerian, Nigerian Americans. I'm just, you know, as they would say in Britain, I'm just gobsmacked. <laughs> so we have to recognize the talent. Talent is universal. Art is universal. That's our common ground. Hmm. I, Carl, Carl, can I just ask one more other thing? Um, you say that there is remarkable adherence to COVID guidelines there. And, you know, I feel like American individualism is killing us. <laughs> and it, I, I must be in Vermont because I got a strong socialist streak in me. But here in Vermont, we've got the lowest rates in the nation because people are largely adherent. The risk now, the spikes are the college students coming back. What is going on when you see this, these kinds of more communitarian societies, if that's the collectivist, whatever, uh, when we see, see these communities that are willing to work together to achieve common goods as opposed, how do you, how do you what are the lessons that you've learned from your work abroad as you look back on the US at a time like this when we are unable to work together for common goals? Well, that's a whole other long conversation. I think the short story is it's a, it's a mix of things. I mean, for example, I, I lived in Malawi, I lived in the Congo. They have strong tribal systems there. You know, the tribal chiefs, they set the tone and people are very obedient, they follow them and that sort of thing. So there's, there's that kind of a thing. And in Nigeria, it's the same sort of a thing. But for example, right now I'm staying in a hotel which caters to diplomats and foreigners. And in short, a lot of it's just driven by fear because they know if they don't comply, they'll lose their job. So there's that. I was just surprised to find in the middle of the night, people who are cleaning the floors, even when the hallways are empty, they're keeping social distancing and wearing the mask, even when no one's there, no one's watching, because they don't want to lose their livelihood, because they're so close to also poverty. So that's part of it. I mean, we could go in a lot of different directions. So it's societal, and it's just, you know, basically the, the kitchen table issues as well. But, you know, in fact, people are reminding me, says, Carl, please put on your mask. They're being polite, which goes back to what you say. Don't be so individualistic. It's not enough to say that, well, if I'm not sick, I'm okay. That's not the point. Because that's the problem with our leader, who should go nameless. He says, well, I'm not sick, I'm okay. I get tested every day. That's what he says. Well, other people don't, and other people can't afford to. The only reason I got my test, I was given two days notice to come here. I was supposed to leave on Friday, and then I left on Sunday. And I said, well, you know something? For a 24-hour result test for COVID, it costs 500 pounds. And I said, but there's no way I'm going to pay 500 pounds. That's a lot of money. And yet, because they wanted me to come, they paid for it. I said, okay, fine. But not everyone can do that. That's what I'm saying. Because some people wait seven days or longer. So I'm humbled by that. And I don't take it for granted. Right. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks. I miss you all. And Leslie, thank you so much for being the glue. You're the adhesive. You're the real hero, Leslie. Well, it's just, you know, I think it comes from goodwill. You know, I, I remember our class and it exhibited tremendous goodwill. And I think goodwill is a factor that we have to cling to in these troubled times because that is really the, I think,
the American dream based on certain kind of ideals that maybe they were false ideals if you think about the founders and maybe they were slave owners, everything, but it was a dream. And I think to lose that dream really is to lose the kind of adherence to community. So I'm so happy that we are all here together. Um, Leslie, wanted, Leslie, 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 yeah. one quick note to you then. The way you yeah. speak, the way you are, it's not too late. You can still run for mayor of New York. <laughs> I don't think so. I think I'm a little bit too idiosyncratic. You have to kind of fit in more. But thank you, Carl. You always were supportive. Um, I want to um, just um, thank everyone. This is kind of, uh, we're ending our normal hour uh, session, but I want to invite everyone who's here to our continued session, which is the cocktail party for Mary White. Now, in the kind of usual times, we would be, you know, going to the other room and I'd serve cocktails. So it's kind of a mental thing, but um, I invite you all just to continue and we'll just continue our informal conversation together. Um, thank you. Thanks, Leslie, and thank you all for coming. And I would love now, as we move to the next room, so to speak, let's have a conversation. Marco, so good to see you, thank you. Yes, sorry I'm late. I, I feel like I missed a, a rich conversation up yeah. until this point. But I, oh, I've it was, it was a one of a kind, you're you, <laughs> never, late. Late. I'll tell you another time. <laughs> So good to be good um, to be joined. Better late yeah. than never. I yes, guess. that's right. Yeah. It's it good to just see matters folks. that we communicate and are talking to each other. That's of course the wonderful thing. Um, Mark, I don't think um, you know we have talked. What's new with you? Where where have we found you? I I'm still inside the Beltway, um, uh, not not far in the Maryland suburbs. Um, uh, and and have been just working from home the same way many many others of you have been for for six months. Uh, it's um, uh, it 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 certainly is because it, it it is a a routine that I did not expect.